gentlemen, welcome to the MTB Podcast, episode 114. We apologize for not being consistent with our podcast as we have been doing summertime things and also I was sick. But this podcast, we have a special guest because Jared is currently in Whistler, still in Whistler, asking a girl to marry him. So it is myself, I am Jeff. I am Troyden. <laughs> Liam and Troyden are here. Troyden is the co-founder of Crestline Bikes. Uh, if you've listened to the podcast for a while, you've heard us talk about Crestline plenty of times. Uh, Troyden is the friend of ours that was the co-founder of Crestline. So we're going to ask him all sorts of various questions that we came up with and ones we got from our audience uh, about Crestline Bikes. And also hit Troyden with some other random mountain bike questions just to hear his answers because he's an experienced South African mountain biker. Tell us about yourself, Troy. Well, um, you probably know I love riding bikes and started kind of late in my life um, and basically felt like I had to catch up. So as soon as the e-bikes came around, I was like, sweet, I can get more down, downhill riding in. <laughs> so. Jumped on the wagon pretty quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. So e- e-bikes, I mean, I just out of curiosity, because I remember the early days of Crestline, it was you were kind of thinking it was going to be an e-bike only company, but then you made a downhill bike. So where, where are you guys going at this point? So I guess like the first bike I ever had was a downhill bike, and that was sort of how I got into mountain biking. Um, so I, you know, just fell in with a group that was really into downhill, did a bunch of shuttling. Uh, so that was sort of my entry into it. And then uh, actually went the opposite direction to most people who start, you know, on more the sort of pedally side of things and then migrate to the gravity side. I started on the gravity side and then got more into pedaling bikes as, got, as I got more into bikes. Um, realized I wasn't that great at pedaling up the hill. <laughs> and... Um, so when e-bikes came along, jumped on one of those and yeah, just, you know, was like, okay, cool. I can get on board with this, uh, just get to have the fun and, uh, avoid the pain, which some people don't see the same way I do. Um, but yeah. And then, uh, when we started making the e-bike, uh, I think it was more, you know, obviously we have this, I have this downhill kind of background. So does my business partner, Mark. And because of how long things were taking to actually get the e-bike going, we decided to do a downhill bike uh, to kind of keep us busy while we were waiting for parts and whatnot during COVID. So that's kind of why we did that. And we also thought it'd be a nice, cool thing to have a downhill bike, which is kind of the heritage of the brand and the fact that we love gravity riding. and um, That's where we come from ultimately. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I got the sense that you guys don't really care too much about many things other than making really good bikes that you yourselves want to ride. Is that kind of a good way to look at it? Yeah, I think that's definitely a good way to look at it. Um, at the time when we started, there weren't a ton of options out there uh, as far as you know the longer travel e-bikes. Uh, they did start coming out right around when we started and you know, obviously at that point we were like, cool, well, the train's left the station. Um, we still think there's some stuff that we can add um, and some value we can add by doing our own bikes. And, yeah, so we focused on those things and, and you know, forged on. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I'm stoked. I think uh, I've, I've spent a small amount of time on some crest lines, but Liam has ridden them a lot more and he can probably speak to more of, of how they ride. Liam, you rode the, the downhill bike in Whistler a lot last season and then the e-bike quite a bit this season, right? You're, you're somewhat in love, I would say. Yeah. I mean, the downhill bike's pretty incredible. I spent pretty much most of my bike park time on a downhill bike last season. So locally shuttles big bear summit um and then like four days in whistler with troyden last summer um on the downhill bike so it's pretty fun to ride that just works really well it's definitely pretty purpose built race bike um and then yeah the the e-bike is just uh it rips like there's not much much else to describe it It, it's got the bosch motor it, it rides good uh it's pretty confident inspiring um and it is a full power, so it's, you know, 50 plus pounds, but 
it still has pretty good maneuverability, um, you know, buzzwords, playful, poppy and stuff for being a 50, 50 pound bike. So I think I was on the e-bike when you were riding the downhill bike in Whistler. <laughs> yeah, you were on the e-bike the whole week, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually pretty fun in the bike park. Uh, some guys uh, might not agree and might think, well, if you're there and you've got a chairlift, you know, why not ride the downhill bike? I think um, the reason I wasn't on one at that time was you were po- possibly riding my downhill bike, right, Liam? And yeah, we just set it up for you. I think you only had two at the time, and one might have been another media company, and then I just <laughs> rode yours. So yeah. yeah, and actually what I found with the e-bikes in the in the bike park is – that extra weight kind of deadens all the braking bumps. Um, and yeah, it's pretty stable in the, the big like bike park turns and berms. So they're pretty fun. And then you've got like pretty big jumps. So it's not like you're trying to pop off something small, like you would on like a little trail bike, you know, you're sending pretty big jumps. So the, the extra weight actually is quite nice in the air. The bike feels pretty stable. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, on a testing side of things, what's a better use than to get what we do last week? We did 17,000 feet of descending in one day. Like, yeah, as far as testing durability and, and feeling in different parts go, like, that's probably the best case you could do. So, yeah, definitely a good way to test the e bikes, man. Yeah, nothing eats bikes and bike parts more than Whistler Bike Park and just Whistler in general. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so, and I, and I think last year, I must have done like a couple of trips up there and, you know, like the entire trip with you, Liam, was on the e-bike and definitely a good few trips back afterwards or so on the e-bike and just, yeah, went through some rear wheels. <laughs> <laughs> but um, everything else seemed to hang together all right. So, yeah. Yeah, Troy, and you, you spent a lot of time riding Rocky Peak, which is fairly local to us and used to be local to you back when you lived in SoCal. Now you're in Bellingham. But Rocky Peak seems like it was one of those areas to me that enlightened a lot of people to how much fun e-bikes could be and full power e-bikes because the, well, Liam, you can probably describe it better. It's like, there's a, what is it like eight mile climb and then a two mile descent or how, how's the layout work? Yeah. I don't know the mileage is exactly, but it's roughly like three to 400 feet of a road climb and then like five to 800 feet of a pretty steep fire road and not very many miles. Um, so on a normal bike, I would do three, maybe four laps when I was pedaling enduro bikes quite a bit. And like, you'd be pretty smoked on that third, fourth lap. Like I think I actually had my two biggest crashes at Rocky peak, like on a fourth lap day. Um, Troy would probably only make maybe two, maybe three of those laps on a pedal bike. <laughs> and, and I'd probably be whining and asking you guys to shuttle me on the road section. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, the e-bikes just open up options, right? You can basically kill a battery, and you're pretty smoked as far as your arms go, but, like, you know, you're you're still with it on the downhill. You're not delirious and, like, so tired from pedaling basically a 1,000 feet a lap um, with, you know, 34-pound bike because you need downhill tires. You need, you know, 160, 170, 180 mil travel forks up there, so. Yeah, because that, I mean, after you do the the climbing, you have – Oh, what five plus different downhill trails to ride that are all super well built and really fun and people absolutely love and like that's the motivation for kind of doing laps at this place yeah i think there's maybe even like eight now um nice but they're all quite proper downhill trails like we we have a joke like from riding other local places on the bikes you go to rocky peak and you got to add five psi to your fork and 10 year shock like right away you have rocky peak pressures just because the compressions are so hard and uh the rock drops and stuff so pretty chunky trails for sure yeah you know yeah that and i mean that i'm assuming that area um kind of was was part of the inspiration right of of the longer travel full power e-bike for you Troyden. i think so i think um i think the key for us was if you're gonna have a bike that you can pedal to the top and you have a bike that has the right characteristics while still having long travel, there's no downside really, right, to having that extra travel. If you've got a bike that's got all this travel but then feels wallowy and feels cumbersome, and and then you're kind of getting all these downsides to that. And then, then you can sort of see like, well, you know, is it worth having all that travel? But if you can get the platform to work in a way that, 
doesn't have those downsides, but yet you have the extra travel, there's no sense not having it because you're climbing up the mountain with with a motor, right? So, and um, yeah, that was a, a big reason why we went that route. But also, it just depends on, on where you ride, right? And so I actually have my bike uh, set up in a weird in-between mode that anyone can do. Um, and that is if you take our bike, you use the full length stroke and you, you flip the chip into the short travel setting, it reduces the travel from 175 to 163. And you can pair that with like a 170 fork and have a 170, 163 bike. And um, where I ride now, that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, so just depends. So say, say you used to live near Rocky Peak and then you moved to another area where you just don't have those kinds of trails. The nice thing is to be able to, you know, cater to that and change your bike and not have to go out and buy another bike. Also, people that are starting out and are not necessarily someone who thinks they need a ton of travel, nice to start at a 150 level, right? 150, 160, still a decent amount of travel. Um, you know, progress uh, as a rider and then be able to bump that up without being in a position where you now have to go out and get another bike, you know? Um, so I think that was all of those things were taken into account when we designed the bike and worked on the bike. Um, obviously for us, you know, we're, and what I'm seeing too is the long travel version is just the most popular. There's, there's no uh, disputing that, you know? Um, and I think it's because the bike still feels very similar in either setting. Yeah, yeah, totally. So well, just for, for clarity, the RS 205, that's the full blown downhill bike, not an e-bike. And then the RS 7550 and then the RS 5075. Give us, give us the little rundown of like how those, the longer travel and the less, less travel work on the e-bike models. So, um, in hindsight, I've also realized that this, the, the model <laughs> the names and stuff are a little confusing. <laughs> Um, not the first or last person in the bike industry to make confusing model names. Don't worry. Yeah. So, but the reason we did it like that was literally like, um, it is the travel setting, right? So the, the 205 is the downhill bike comes with 205 mils of travel. That bike's got some flexibility as well. Liam knows, um, there's like a short stroke option, which drops it to 190. We do have a link that, um, Cascade have been working on actually get it all the way down to 180, um, and people, some people have set those up as enduro bikes. I've actually seen a couple with transmission on them. We've got an idler pulley that um, uh, Cascade are working on that's set up for the new flat top chain and everything. So that'll really help those guys that want to have that as like a burly enduro bike. And then when it comes to the e-bike, um, the way we did the model number was just the way it was uh, set up from the factory. So uh, if it was built as a long travel version in the long travel settings, the 75 comes first. That's 175 rear travel, right? And then you can adjust it all the way down to 150. So that's why we did 7550. And then vice versa for the shorter travel one. So if it left the factory as a 150 bike, then it's a 5075. You still have the opportunity to bump it up to a, a 175. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, seen much more people wanting the long travel I think what we'll probably do in future is spec most of the bikes, if not all of them, as the long travel version. And then we can always do the change or facilitate what needs to happen to change it to either the slightly shorter travel or the 150 travel uh, if someone wants to go that route. Uh, I think it's going to be simpler for us than uh, changing as many as we had to change from the short travel to the long travel, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the RS seventy five fifty uh, is one seventy five rear travel stock with a one eighty fork. Yeah, correct. The RS fifty seventy five is one fifty rear travel stock with a one sixty fork. Yeah. Cool. And then, how do you adjust the travel ranges? So uh, there's a flip chip on the lower link, and. On the 150 travel version, you're running a 230 by 57 and a half inch shock with the flip chip set in the short travel setting, so in ST. And to get the full amount of travel, you're running a 230 by 65 shock and you have the flip chip set in the LT setting long travel. 
Yep. Nice. So do you think just, this is just out of my own curiosity. Um, do you think that it's a little confusing for some riders who are kind of, I guess if you're buying a bike as high end as a crest line, you're, you're, you're pretty into it, but it is, it is slightly confusing. And it's, have, have you run into problems just like explaining how all this works? Cause even telling someone what a flip chip is, definitely know what that is. It's kind of, kind of hard. It is, it, it, it is definitely um, a bit confusing. I think, like you said, we've been pretty fortunate with a lot of customers that are really into biking, really into e-biking specifically and know what they're looking for. And um, so the majority of the customers we've had kind of know what, what's happening with all that stuff. Um, flip chips have been around for quite a while, so uh, especially on this kind of a platform, sometimes just for a geometry change or a BB height change. Um, so it's it's not too difficult, but I think for definitely some, some confusion and, um, yeah, uh, it is... It is something that maybe I need to clarify a bit more, or make a little bit simpler on the website. And um, I think that's also kind of why we've been led down this road of, you know, just doing the focusing on the long travel one, um, but making it clear to people that we can adjust it to a shorter travel bike if they would like us to. And then, you know, having that as something we would do for them. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. And it seems like, I mean, a lot of that stuff from what I've seen has been explained quite well and a lot of the press you guys have gotten. So um, Pink Bike's done a full write-up. Obviously, we have at Worldwide. And then uh, Rob Rides EMTB, he did a really good video on the bike. So there's some there's some people that are already creating some pretty cool content on the thing. Any any other media that you're, you're stoked on you guys have gotten in the last year? Yeah, so I, I think um, you've definitely mentioned uh, the main ones. Uh, we do have Vital... Uh, who's going to be releasing one fairly soon. They had uh, have had a bike for a while. Um, and then uh, Rob Rides is going to do a ride review fairly soon as well. Uh, I think a lot of those guys are busy with Eurobike and then obviously all the World Cup races that have just happened. You know, all the media sites have been pretty swamped with that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we'll, you'll definitely see a couple more coming out fairly soon. And it has been really good to to have people like that explaining things as well because um someone like rob for example is when we watched his video we were like you know he really does a good job at you know making his point um as far as all the little features and how they work and uh, so it is actually really nice having people like that out there uh, to help you get get that information across to people because what we're also trying to do is is provide something with some flexibility to people you know we're we're a small company. Um, we're focused on a very specific bracket and we want to provide a really cool experience to people, you know, and um, we could be looking at it differently and be like, well, if we did this way, we could sell more bikes or we, but we just want to provide something really cool for people and give them a bunch of options, right. And really have someone uh, give someone the ability to really dial in their bike and have something that they're really happy with. And then also the ability to change and tweak things, right. Sometimes, Riding the same thing gets a bit boring after a while, and it's kind of fun to try something different, even if it's just different. Um, and you can kind of be like, oh, cool, I can feel how different that is, or, you know, that improves this, but then, you know, this is not as great. And it's kind of nice to have that um, because that's part of riding as well, right? And you can get to, like, experience that without having to go out and have all these different bikes, so to speak. Um, so I think that also just adds to the experience of, of being able to um, get out there and enjoy, you know, what our sport has to offer. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely agree. I, uh, I like to change up random things on my bike. Not, not as often as Liam or as often as Liam tries different disciplines. Um, <laughs> but, but to some extent, I, I'm always perplexed that Liam can be, you'll, you'll be on a, a road bike one, one day and then a downhill bike and then a lightweight Grab a bike, bike and then a full power e-bike and yeah how do you manage this liam <laughs> the hardest part is the maintenance on the bikes themselves the easy <laughs> part is riding them <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Well, this this runs slightly into some listener questions, but um, yeah, what are what are kind of future plans? I mean, you're with with Crestline. Uh, what are you, what are you guys trying to boil the ocean with with premium level e bikes, or or what are, what's kind of like the ethos of where you guys are, are driving forward with the bikes you're making in the future? So, I mean, that's definitely our focus, right? We we want to make sure we're we want to make sure we keep having like the best uh, full power e-bike experience. And I think that will always be our focus. Um, this might lead into some questions as well, but um, we have really looked at the lighter power bikes as well. And in a perfect world for me, there would be a bike that's tailored to the person purchasing the bike. And I might get different kinds of pushback on this, um, but in a perfect world for me is like, say you're a 130 pound guy on a, either a small or a medium. I feel like your bike shouldn't have as much power output as the guy on the full, the, the sort of guy on the XL who's 220. Um, because that way you could potentially have a smaller motor. You could potentially have a smaller battery. Your bike would be somewhat lighter and the weight of that bike would be relative to your weight. So you would still have the same experience as somebody on a, a higher powered bike that's heavier, that's a bigger person. And I think there's something to be said about that. I think you will get pushback where there are guys who are like, well, whatever, I'm, I'm smaller, but that's cool. I want the, the more, you know all the power and all the range and all the, I don't care about the weight. Um, so, you know, we'll have to explore that a little bit more, but um, I think there's going to be a lot of really cool options that, you know, are presented to to people in the future and you know you'll be able to really choose what you want to get out of this if you're into e-biking um what i have what we also did notice when we were considering you know where we would start and where we want to go is um there's just more full power e-bikes out there right they were just you know they were the ones that came out first more people have them a lot of people want to ride with their friends you know um so when they decide to get an e-bike, they look around and see what their friends have, right? And, you know, if you want to go ride with your friends and you have a half-power bike, Liam, you know, certain people might be able to to get away with it. Um, if you're a smaller guy, pretty fit, you might be able to hang with some guys on full-power bikes that are bigger guys. Um, but if you're a bigger guy and you're trying to get on a half-power bike and go ride with a bunch of dudes on full-power bikes – you're probably going to be killing yourself. You're not going to have the range that you need. So, again, like um, we just felt like there was more of a uh, a need for full power bikes. And that's not to say we'll never do a half power or a, or a lighter lighter weight bike. Um, we just think that that's like the real focus for us for now is just having the best in that category, um, and then building from that. Yeah. Nice. How many how many bikes do you imagine you'll have in five years? How many different bikes? Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, uh, as you know, it takes quite some time to develop a bike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sure. so five years is actually not that far away um, in, in those terms. Um, I'd like to think we'll always have at least two to three different – suspension level full power e-bikes so from a fairly short travel to like a, a long travel maybe we end up bumping up our travel even more um, on the longer travel side of things so it depends on how you look at that like what you know there might be a company out there who has two e-bikes but we pretty much have the same you know even though it's one frame uh config different configurations i remember when uh I can't remember who it was, but they did like, um, is it Yeti? They did like a lunch ride or they did different configurations of a certain bike that almost made it another bike, even though it was, you know, something else uh, pretty specific. So when I look at it like that, um, you know, two or three full power models, maybe a lightweight uh, model or two, uh, you know, we we did this downhill frame, which was kind of cool because – we were in a position where it was really hard to get parts. Um, and so we were quite far along with the e-bike, but actually getting parts to put them together to bring them into the country was what was holding us up. And that's when I decided to do the downhill frame. Uh, 
actually kind of um, you uh, prompting that as well because I remember you talking about Nico, putting me in touch with Nico, started chatting to him. He had been talking to um, uh, Jimmy at Cascade and yeah. they had been working a bit with each other and then like – we were working with Cascade because they helped us with our kinematics and, you know, and then, you know, one thing led to another and we decided to make the, this like limited edition downhill bike. Um, and it came about quite quickly because of the way we did it. And I think there's an opportunity for us to potentially do something else like that. Um, you know, which could also be cool and kind of bridge a gap between uh, how quickly technology moves and what we want to do on our next e-bike. Cause I think what, is important for us too is to make sure that when we do that um, we choose the right partners and we do the right bike at the right time and that our bike comes out with all the right stuff uh, as opposed to just you know feeling like we have to do something quickly or do something different or you know there's like two years have passed by we need a new bike like I'd rather spend a little bit more time making sure that the next thing we do is the right thing um, rather than just doing something to do something, you know? Yep. I like it, man. It's, it's, an, it's an answer of many words and uh, a lot of passion and attention to detail and thoughtfulness um, and not, not a typical politician uh, <laughs> lack of clarity answer, but in one way it is, but it's good. <laughs> it's like you, you're not it's, – it's funny because – if you know one way to answer that question could have been a very concise like oh we have this dialed in product roadmap and here's what we're going to yeah. do and here's what we promised our sales teams the product team would produce it's like no, no you an you answered the question as a, a true mountain biker who's designing yeah. bikes that you really care about um and not as like a uh you know i think that's what helps us too though jeff is that we're 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 small right so we don't have those kind of constraints where you have those pressures yeah, so where you have to make those decisions and you have to make them so far ahead and you know like when we did the downhill bike we started in december of 2021 we were selling them in i want to say august or september of 22 you know that's like an eight months and that's not to say we didn't test them and we didn't like do what we needed to do it's just that we did it in a slightly different way that was a little bit outside of the box, right? We used a prototype mold, was made in the R&D center. They could do it quicker. We could get them back to test quicker. Like everything was quicker, but then we were limited to the number that we could make. So, yeah, so I think, you know, it does give us a bit of freedom to do things like that. And, um, yeah, it's like you said, too. We just want to try and make the best bike we can because we're riding these bikes as well, right? And... I want to ride a cool bike. So I want to make sure that we make the best thing. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, definitely like paying attention to what's happening, looking at the new like solid state um, battery tech that's being touted everywhere and waiting to see what different manufacturers start using, um, you know, and, and just do the best to make the best decision we can to provide, you know, customers with something cool. Yep. Yeah, it's rad. I love it, man. Well, cool. Before I ask too many of the listener questions, let's take a quick break, and then we will get into some more of these rapid-fire listener questions in just a moment. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hello, everyone. Jeff again. Just a quick note to let you know that we have actually had just a couple cancellations on this crazy Italian mountain bike trip that we are taking with the tour company All Mountain Rides this September 3rd to the 10th. It's going to be incredible. Myself, Liam, and Jared are going uh, eight days riding in the Dolomites in Italy. I cannot wait for this trip. It's being put on by a gentleman, Phil Borman, who put together a amazing mountain bike trip in New Zealand in 2019 that I went on, and it was probably one of the best weeks of my life. And I can't wait to do this Italy trip. If you're interested at all in going on this trip with us, like I had mentioned, we've got a couple spots open right now. Uh, check out the show notes, or if you just Google Worldwide Cyclery Ultimate Dolomites Italy mountain bike trip, you will find it as well. But link in the show notes if you want to check out the details. And uh, yeah, let us know if you're interested in joining us on that trip. We would love to ride some bikes with you guys. And now back to the show. And we are back with some listener questions. Most of these are tailored for you, Troyden. Uh, Liam, why don't you go ahead and read the first one? All right. So, Troyden, how did you come up with the name Crestline? 
So you guys are from Cali and you're probably familiar with the area and you've also come up with brand names and probably know it's not the easiest thing to do, right? It's like nearly impossible in the 2020s. Yeah. So I did have a book um, that probably had like 15 pages of ideas that were not great. (laughs) Um, A book that you made. (laughs) Yeah. A book that I was writing names in. And then, um, yeah, uh, we started thinking about location-based names. Uh, and the fact that we were from California and that's where Mark and I were and that's where I started writing and um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, Crestline is a zone that we love going to. It's not somewhere we went all the time. It's a little bit of a drive to get there. And uh, there's some really cool, pretty well-known um, downhill tracks there. And it's actually somewhere where we did a bunch of the testing as well. And so, Yeah. Was, a, was an appropriate name and we just felt it it was like it's a cool name it like it, it's not like um, it doesn't alienate anyone it's not like a super young name that only sort of young people can really relate to it's not a super old name it's just it just worked so um, yeah uh, when that came up we were like cool this is this is the name yeah Crestline which is what closest to Big Bear Lake Arrowhead area yeah it's kind of on yeah. the back back side of um, Big Bear Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Rad. Cool. Cool like little zone. Yeah. The next question is on the more technical side. Why did you choose to use the Bosch system in your bikes? So I think um, this was something we considered uh, for quite a while, like what to do and what was the right answer. And we had obviously ridden a bunch of e-bikes um, with a number of different systems. Uh, from you know the Bros to the Yamaha to the uh, Shimano Bosch, uh, and we just had our best experience riding experience was with the Bosch. There were certain things about the Bosch that we didn't like. Uh, the integration wasn't that great. That was one of them, and um, tunability, like you got sort of X number of modes, and that's what you got, and you couldn't do anything to it, and. So those things uh, were things that weren't the best uh, on that system. But when we started looking into them, we started seeing that they were making changes to those things. And the the things that were the good things kind of remained. And the things that we felt they needed to work on, they were actually working on. Um, The other nice thing about that system is it's a fully cohesive system provided by a very established company. So... As a new brand, uh, we also want to offer good support to customers and, you know, have them have a good experience. And uh, when you're bigger, you can probably take more chances with using different uh, um, vendors for different things. So you might get a battery from someone because you can get a bigger battery or you can get uh, something that maybe that vendor who provides the motor doesn't offer. But then you have this um, issue that you might run into where if you have something that happens, people start pointing fingers at each other and, you know, the person who made the battery is like, no, the battery is working fine. And then the person who made the motor is like, no, the motor is working fine, but these things are not talking to each other. Now, now what do you do? So for us, um, it was important to have a system that was cohesive. Uh, If we have an issue with it, it's Bosch. We go to Bosch and we get it sorted out. Simple as that. And, and it's arguably, you know, one of the best on the market right now. So I think that all lined up nicely for us and, um, yeah, we're pretty happy with that choice. Yeah, they seem to be having like just a really good reputation that they're holding on to that good reputation thus far in the e-bike space and also seem to be coming out with a lot of new stuff at a pretty fast pace that looks really well and you know, just like well done and refined, which I'm I'm pretty impressed, which seems like they they're they're just competitive when it comes to trying to be in this market and be a leader in it, which is killer. Good to see that. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, your Crestline was the first bike with both the wireless motor and integrated screen in the top tube. For oh, yeah. Bosch, right? With the wireless remote, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if we were, but I feel like we were one of the first, if not the first, to have the race motor in the US. Um, and then, like you say, the Bluetooth mini remote and the system controller and the screen and everything, basically all the bells and whistles of the new stuff. Um, also the um, 
the valve stem magnets are no wire and cable running to your rear wheel um, and, the, you know, like magnet on your uh, disc or anything like that. So all those cool little things that they came out with, um, we managed to kind of be there, you know, as those came yeah. out, which was cool. Yeah. Nice. Work, worked out good. Definitely. Uh, next question is how was the reception for a brand that mainly makes only e-bikes? I guess it's slightly confused because when you guys originally started talking about and launching Crestline, you were going to do e-bikes and then you're like, oh no, check out this super cool downhill bike. And now it's like, <laughs> well, what's Crestline going to make? Is this an e-bike company? Cause you told us it was, but now it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end of the day, what do you need, bro? A downhill bike and an e-bike. There's nothing else you really need, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do pretty much everything on that. You got your bike to go on trips, go ride parks, go ride chairlifts, have a bunch of fun. And you got your e-bike to do whatever you want. Go ride with your cross-country mates. <laughs> go ride with your downhill guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah, so, it's weird. I, I guess I have four too many bikes then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I can, go ride, I can go ride with you on any of your bikes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the reception has been pretty good. Uh, I think uh, – Maybe part of it is because of, you know, where it comes from, you know, and the fact that we're focused on this sort of gravity side of the sport. And that's what we love and that's what we want to be our thing and our heritage. heritage. And, and so that's why the DH bike worked. And if you go and actually look at the downhill riders, and you go and, like, follow a bunch of the guys that race World Cups and, like, 90% of them love e-bikes <laughs> because yeah. they're, they're, they're cut from the same cloth. You know, they want to ride down the mountain. They want to get as many laps as they can. And they want a bike that's capable to do that. And so those are the things we focused on. So the reception has been pretty good. Yep. Has anyone been like, oh, you guys need to make a trail bike or an enduro bike kind of thing? Uh, we have had like a little bit of like, hey, it would be nice to have like a like a shorter travel. Actually, what, what we have had is guys have ridden the e-bike and been like, damn, this would be a really cool enduro bike, you know, like. Mm. It would be sick to have this without a motor. So that is definitely something we've heard and, you know, it makes you think a little bit. I think for us coming in as a brand late to the game like this or a new brand uh, when so many brands are so established and it's the sport is pretty refined right now, like it's hard to buy a really sh a really bad bike, right? Um, so for us it was like, firstly, we're being true to what we love. Uh, which is what we're making. And secondly, it works because it is one segment that is still not as old as the rest of the um, segments are with these guys that have all these bikes that span across all these sort of different genres within our sport. Um, so, yeah, I don't, you, know, you, know, you never know. Like, never say never. We didn't know we were going to do the downhill bike. Who knows? Maybe we do an enduro bike at some point, do like a limited thing. Might be cool. I don't know. <laughs> yeah uh, I like it <laughs> nothing in stone just kind of doing whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good way to operate yeah what was the hardest part of designing the bike so it's kind of weird but I think the hardest part was not actually designing it it was getting parts to put on it <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think that was the most challenging part was i remember it was 2020 2021 like january when mark and i said to each other okay cool you know like let's do this so we like formed the company and we were like okay we're, we're doing it and i believe that within my first two months we had ordered parts for the bikes for delivery of September of 2022. So it's about an 18 month, around an 18 month lead time. Yeah. And I and, and I was like, okay, cool. I think I think we're safe, you know? Like that should be good. <laughs> um I still don't have confirmation for delivery on some of those parts that went in <laughs> <laughs> in August of 20 um in sorry, in January or February of 2021, but um yeah, so there was some scrambling that happened. Um, I ended up getting uh, some North American OE accounts set up because I couldn't get Taiwan OE accounts set up. 
I had to order some parts for the first batch of bikes that I ordered here in the US in aftermarket packaging and then had to ship to Taiwan to get assembled. So yeah, there, there've definitely been um, definitely been some challenges. The designing part, uh, I think we actually got a little bit lucky in one or two senses because uh, firstly, we got in at a really good factory. Um, people have reminded us of this a couple of times, you know, and I didn't maybe realize in the beginning, but uh, other people in the industry have made it clear. And, you know, I'm so grateful that we got in. And at the time uh, they were going through COVID, uh, the factories were shut down. A lot of the workers were sent home, but a lot of the engineers and the 3D surfacing guys and uh, were kept at the factory. And they had a lot of capacity. And I remember when we were working on our bike, we actually got a ton of support on that side of things that I don't think you normally get. And so, you know, at one point we had, you know, you design one size first and then from there you break out and do the other sizes and then they start making those other molds. And I remember them saying to us, hey, do you want our 3D guys to start doing your, um, your sort of like RH2 and your RH4 uh, while you guys finalize and we were like, uh, sure, like that would be amazing. And I think it's because they were there, they had the time, you know. So, and it was pretty helpful for us too because these are the guys that check your work. Um, so we we had already like got the aesthetic and stuff down on the frame, but then when it comes to clearances, tolerances, all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, it was actually super helpful having having them uh, looking over the frame and and doing things because that's what they do. You know, they check you know, all the manufacturers will submit their drawings and stuff and they'll check them. So, yeah, so I think we got a bit lucky with that. So, um, yeah, it's, I think the hardest part of designing is like, is being like, okay, cool, it's finished. You know, let's make this thing and get it out. Cause you can always change little things. You can always make things better. You can always, so it's, that's kind of hard to let go. And I think, uh, coming from a music background it was very similar, you know, a song's never finished because you can always change something. Um, and it's very hard, especially in a creative thing, to actually be like, okay, I'm cool with that. Let's yeah. let's roll with it. It's never done. Uh, yeah, it's never done. But the nice thing is you can always make another song. You can always make another bike, right? You can always improve on. So I think the key is like you also have to, you have to let those things go at some point. Otherwise, you will never have anything come out, right? Yep. So – that's some good life advice right there, Troy. <laughs> yeah, this is now a life podcast. It's no longer the mountain bike podcast. Yeah. Well, I'm it sure does, you, does apply to many facets of life, right? It does. It really yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, this next question I'll let Liam ask since it's another thing that'll be full of life advice. <laughs> it's super, yeah, we need an answer right away. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite mountain bike component to use when eating soup? I feel like I read these questions and for some reason I didn't read this question. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, this man. is the when we ask the worldwide cyclery audience for questions, this you, get you get this hilarious combination of business related questions in the bike industry to super technical uh, mountain bike specific questions in geometry to component preferences to things like you know, have you ever shit in your chamois? Like there's just, it's just all, it spans the gamut of yeah. funny mountain bikers, just depending on when they happen to see the Instagram story and reply, whether they were, you know, two beers yeah. deep or mid ride uh -huh. or, or <laughs> board at work or whatever. I'm not sure there is a good component. I'm trying to think of the best component to eat soup with. And I mean, I think I'm going to go with the brake hose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like because you can cut the brake hose and use it as a straw and actually eat the soup. <laughs> I would go with a grip because if you take a just a grip, you could it's like a spoon. You could, like, you could sort of stuff spoon the it. soup. You could spoon it in there. You could yeah. put the broth in there and then just use your finger to kind of jam in some <laughs> of the noodles and then pour it in. That's my what? <laughs> what's your answer, Liam? I think I'd take the saddle and I'd put the soup in a tire. And like mm. the combo would kind of work pretty well, that could especially work. if it's like a more hearty soup, you know. No. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody, actually... yeah, I, I wouldn't be getting any of the like goodies. I'd just be getting like no. a very strange version. Broth. Yeah, I've got the broth. broth. Pure broth. 
<laughs> Some, somebody told us just recently, actually, um, a, a guy who was on the Chasing Epic trip with us, he was, he was commenting how he thought it was hilarious that we would read these, these questions and then uh, actually answer them. Like, he, you know, I think, I think most people would probably hear you. It's like, oh, what's your favorite component to eat with the soup? And then you would just like go on with your life and go to the next question. But we actually would, we would answer them. Like yeah. every one of us would have a thought out answer and, and nice. give it to you. Nice. And, uh, we got a compliment on that. So I'm, we're going to, we're going to continue to answer the questions. Keep um, it going. Yeah, nice. we'll keep it going. Um, this next There's, question is. Never, never heard this one before. There's also a pink bike comment, I'm pretty sure, somehow done in our, in our DMs. <laughs> Definitely, this hasn't come up, like, since we started. Quote, I'm unquote. Like, this has never, ever come up, this question. Uh, <laughs> or anything to do with this. Quote, unquote, <laughs> looks like a Santa Cruz. Uh, was there inspiration from Santa Cruz VPP platform? How does Crestline differ? I, I think, okay, so for starters, you know, there, there was – just for historical reference for people who don't remember, there was that sort of hilarious thing on pink bike for seemingly five years where everyone just said, looks like a session yeah. and any horse link bike that people would say that. And like, it was funny, but then it wasn't funny and it got overused. And then everyone just likes to say that. And, and to the untrained eye, everything can look the same, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think you probably actually have some, you know, you got a high pivot VPP. Let's yeah. Elaborate on this one for us. Sure. So, firstly, I think that what your your first comment is pretty poignant, and I think there's definitely a lot more bikes that have that kind of a layout and look like that, right? Yeah. And I feel like that might just be because that's been around for longer. I could be wrong. Um, I think it's a fairly easy platform to tune, which is another reason why I think a lot of people use it. Um, the reason why we went with what we went with was – uh, we've always liked the way that platform writes. And um, so we've always liked a dual link platform with a, with a fixed one piece triangle. And I don't know if it's because we're heavy, heavier riders or um, I've always just felt that the rear end when it's done properly just feels a bit stiffer. And um, yeah, I've just liked the way it works. And then, you know, we thought for a long time, um, we worked with uh, a couple of different, people in the beginning one of them was caesar from um thera designs also like behind you know and uh went through a couple platform options and just felt like we didn't want to do something different for the sake of being different um and rather felt like we wanted to use something that we knew was tested proven worked well was available to be used and that we could make sure was done correctly. And so that's why we ultimately ended up using someone like Cascade who have been, you know, tuning that platform since the start of their business um, and worked with them to do ours. And the nice thing about, um, about VPP is you get pretty drastic changes with pretty small movements, which is not the case with a lot of the other platforms. So this can work in your favor, but can also work against you. It's quite easy to screw it up, but then it is also quite easy to change things and get different outcomes and have different options. So even once we had you know, decided on the bike, decided on the geo, decided on some main points, we can still mess with one or two points that are left over that are available to be messed with and continue testing and doing different stuff. So we felt that that was really a nice feature. Um, plus, we've had really good experiences with a lot of bikes set up like this, and especially with uh, Cascade links on them. So that's kind of why we decided to go that route. And then the downhill bike um, is almost an extension of that, where you know we did the kind of mid-high pivot thing, hadn't been done yet with VPP. I know Santa Cruz have experimented with it. Um, ultimately, I don't think Greg really liked the way that rode for him. He's been riding, you know, the current bike for so long. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think that's why we went with what we went with. Yeah, so when it comes to bikes that have that VPP layout, um, 
even small changes in the link and the placement of the pivots can make a pretty substantial difference. So even if they have somewhat of a similar look, they can still ride quite differently. Am I understanding that correctly? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately the look is, is the look, right? Like you said to you, it's like, looks like a session and looks, look, those bikes do not all ride the same. Right. Yeah. Totally. And, and, and the, the, the changes on those need to be actually bigger than the changes on ours. So, as our look is kind of and and we try to consider that and you know that's why you'll see our top link has a certain shape to it and, you know something that we try to make um that will probably become like a thing for us um as opposed to just doing it like you know some of the other guys have done it and uh yeah i mean we wanted something that works we knew this worked and it also eliminates um you know, as, as if you think about it, like a, a user coming in to purchase a new bike from a new brand that's unknown, we need to eliminate as many of those unknowns as possible, right? Um, so they can see the platform. They know the p- people who have tuned the platform. So there's a good chance that it's going to work well or a better chance than some random thing that just, you know, we threw together. And it's made in a factory that makes all the other bikes that everybody else makes. So... You know, you're just like eliminating these these questions along the way while making the best thing you can make, mm-hmm. and that was that was the way we looked at it. Yeah, I yeah. like it. It's good. Well, and when you start refining something and you refine it and you refine it over time, uh, you kind of like get down to this point, right? Like if you look at vehicles, if you look at cars, yeah. there's a reason why the last twenty. 30 years they've all kind of followed the same suit it doesn't mean they all drive the same it doesn't mean all bikes ride the same but like once you continue to refine something like it's gonna end up at this point where it's gonna be pretty much similar um as far as aesthetically goes because that's just gonna be the best you know the best the best way to do it yeah the best way to do it so yeah look at dirt bikes you know yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like no one's fighting about what they look like they all look the same they have like a different color seat you know? Yeah, they, they <laughs> it's like, unbelievably the same. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Oh, that is funny. That's a that's a hilarious like <laughs> analogy to draw. Yeah. Um, what is what's your prediction for the next innovation in e bikes? So I mean, I think the the obvious one is like is like batteries. You know, it seems like it's going to be a race to like who gets who gets to use the new battery tech first kind of thing and what, what that is, or maybe it's not a battery, but something else that powers the thing that's lighter and smaller. Right. Um, that seems to be the, the, I feel like that will be the biggest thing. I do also like some of the other stuff that's popping up. Uh, Liam and I were talking about it today. We saw a uh, pinion with a gearbox, internal gearbox motor. Um, I think that's really cool. You know, and I think there's some really cool stuff that can come from that. Um, I love the idea of like a belt drive uh, to eliminate noise and potentially maintenance, and then you know having all your your gears internal, so you know moving that weight off the rear wheel. Um, the new transmission stuff is good, works really well. A little bit heavier, so maybe some people will see that in the wrong going in the wrong direction. I've been running it for a while. I don't feel like it's overly noticeable, if at all. I might not be in tune enough to pick that up, but I do feel like there's a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of room for cool stuff, you know, and I think it's going to take time for the right things to emerge as what that cool stuff is. And some guys are going to get it right and get lucky and get on early and, um, yeah, so we just have to kind of, you know, look at everything properly and you know, try to make those decisions appropriately. Yep. Yeah. Nice. I like it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Liam, next question. <laughs> Will mid-power e-bikes become the norm? I would, I would also like to ask, what exactly is a mid-power e-bike? Yeah. <laughs> Do you, I'll let Liam answer the mid-power e-bike question. And then I'll. I mean, I, yeah. I guess you could kind of say something like a forest also almost a mid power e bike because you do have the specialized uh, SL range, which is like a thirty five newton meter power, and then you have the forest all at a sixty or sixty five, um, 
Fazua and TQ are also maybe more in that mid power versus like the SL motor. I honestly have no clue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what the funny enough is the industry has very very sort of decided on what you know what the travel range is for a cross country bike and a trail bike and an enduro bike and a downhill bike. Maybe that will be how this plays out with e bikes. Like eventually, we'll sort of say like, oh, you know, light light e bike, mid power, full power. Like we'll. I think you, kind I of think you touched the, the range yeah. in our head when people say those words. I think you touched on it there. I think. I think a mid power e bike is simply a lighter weight e bike yeah. yeah. that has a little bit less power. I mean, yep. that that's what it is. It, that's what it boils down to. Is some people, you know, are against the weight. Um, I think the more you ride them, the more you start to appreciate it and actually somewhat enjoy it. Um, but again, it depends. You know, like I'm also like I'm I'm over six foot. I'm two twenty. Like. So maybe that doesn't affect me as much. So, you know, I don't want to be, uh, what's the right word, like selfish and not pay attention to what other people are experiencing. I think weight is definitely a thing. And I think there's there's definitely a space for those bikes. I do also think those bikes are helping e-bikes in general almost as a little bit of a gateway drug where, you know, guys that are purists, that are real analog riders, not really interested in e-bikes, it's much easier to get them on a mid power bike, like a half power bike that's you know not that much heavier than their full blown e- enduro bike with downhill tires, whatever, whatever. And then they actually get to see how much fun they can be, you know. And before you know it, they're like, oh, maybe I will try a full power bike and see what it's like. <laughs> like so, another uh, gateway hurt. drug. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, I- it totally is kind of like that. Like it totally happened with our riding group down here. They're almost all on SL bikes and now they're almost all on full powers. Yeah. And so I think, I don't know if it would become the norm, but I do think that the gap between the full powers, I guess you, you probably think of it in two ways, right? Like the, the half power bikes might get slightly lighter, slightly smaller as the full power bikes get slightly lighter as well so they're both going to be heading in that direction because that's the, that's kind of the trajectory everybody's chasing that how do we make these things more efficient same amount of power slightly lighter a um, little bit slimmer looking all those kinds of things that's that's what everyone's chasing so those two those two like segments are going to go in the same direction i don't know if they go far enough to the point where the mid power one just disappears and then the full power one is is so close to what the mid power ones were when they started that it doesn't really matter anymore and you don't need that mid power one. I can't really say, you know, what's going to happen. Um, I'm a little worried about the bikes below that, you know, the, the old, the older day bikes that don't have any batteries or motors <laughs> or anything. <laughs> like where do those go? <laughs> if well, it's going to be like new. driving, it's going to be like driving vintage cars. People will still drive them just for the nostalgia, you know? <laughs> no, I'm just, I think there'll always be place for real, real bikes and, you know, uh, especially in racing environments, stuff like that, where yeah. people are being tested I mean, physically. So, For yeah. me, I I do feel the weight sometimes if I go from riding my, you know, short travel bike to a crest line. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, it's almost double the weight. Yeah. Um, however, if I'm on the crest line for three or four days in a row, I stop noticing the weight, right? Yeah. Um, so it just kind of depends what your arsenal is, what your goal is, um, you know, so and – and like you said, batteries will start getting lighter as far as the wattage goes and the range goes. Motors will get lighter. So, like, that gap will probably close over time. Um, and then you'll kind of just – you might even just be able to pick your battery size. And then that will be a 5, 10-pound difference even. Yeah. So. Yeah, it would be cool to see where it goes. You know, I think it's just – there's so, so many cool things available that can happen, you know, um, as people spend more time on this stuff. Yeah, I mean, just in the way that the industry's evolved so far with the existing bikes we have, it's like not not one new bike cannibalized another. I mean, I guess you could kind of say that wheel sizes have had some, you know, effects over the years as the way they've evolved. But in, in terms of different travel ranges and weight ranges of bikes, like 
just because enduro bikes are fun does not mean that XC bikes will disappear. And just because, yeah. you know, a trail bike is fun doesn't mean that downhill bikes will disappear. Like it's all, there's space for all of them at different times and different preferences and different use cases. And I don't know, to me, that's half yeah. of what makes the industry fun is that there's yeah. all these different things to try and ride and enjoy. Exactly. And now we've just got some more, right? We've yeah. just got a few more options. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's awesome. And, and I think it's just a pendulum, right? Like, I mean, I've been in the industry pretty heavy for a decade now, and it just it swings back and forth. Enduro bikes are super sweet for two years. <laughs> then it's kind of, you know, short travel bikes, then it's trail bikes. Now it's e-bikes, you know, and then my swing back might be short travel bikes again. But, you know, people still ride what they want to ride. It's just kind of like that that kind of popular p- pendulum is going to swing. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good definitely. way to think about it. Well, the last question we have for you, Troyden, um, which actually this is this is pretty interesting for people that do ride e-bikes a lot, which is, is it? do you feel it's beneficial to have the SRAM transmission drivetrain on an e-bike? I do think it's, uh, it's definitely a, um, a drivetrain that caters really nicely to e-bikes. And, you know, first and foremost, it's because of how they've managed to get it to shift under load. It's much it's much harder to be conscious of that on an e-bike, um, and it is nice to just forget about it and just kind of like crank through when you need to and just keep going. And honestly, some of the times your motor is pushing, you know, and you might not necessarily want to be like if you're in kind of boost mode or um, race mode on a Bosch motor and the, the overdrive kicks in and you change gears. Like I think transmission is definitely uh, good good for that you know so i've been running it for a little while now and yeah it's, it's, it's pretty sick yep yeah it makes sense to me and man just just for a lot of reasons especially shifting under load but even i mean even just with the added weight of an e-bike you imagine the thing kind of in a crash scenario and the bike tumbling down a hill and it's just the, the durability and the lack thereof of a derailleur hanger Seems yeah. like a good call the heavier the bike gets yeah I took a pretty decent spill where I hit a tree and then the bike like shot over the other way and like, like I scuffed up the rear triangle a bit, I think Dem saw. And I think the derailleur took a pretty decent like hit to it. And yeah, it's, it's fine. Like I didn't even, I didn't even really think about it when it happened, you know? And then afterwards I saw what like the frame took like a decent hit right there. And I was like, so yeah, I think they've done a good job. Yeah. Nice. Good stuff. Well, we appreciate the time, man. Uh, I hopefully that people who are interested in Crestline uh, enjoy this episode. And if we want to, if anyone wants to contact you, you're obviously you can just Google Crestline Bikes. That's your guys' website, Instagram. Um, it sounds like you're the the main guy answering the emails and all the DMs right now. So yeah, uh, yeah, shoot us a message info at CrestlineBikes.com. Definitely happy to answer the questions and chat to guys about bikes and th- thanks for having me on the podcast guys yeah absolutely appreciate thank it. you Troyden. Yep. appreciate it thanks, man Jordan. thank thank everyone for listening and if you guys uh yeah want to hear more from us don't hesitate to email podcast at worldwidecyclery.com and we will do our best to try and get back on consistent podcasts here um albeit we put the quality of life and vacations and bike trips ahead of recording podcasts but We'll, we'll worry about that at some point in the future. <laughs> when we're old. <laughs> when, we're, when we're old. <laughs> like me. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.